my lovely misfit tans and welcome back to my channel. As all of you requested, I'm gonna be talking about my tried and true supplies for this particular video. And these are supplies that I really could not live without. I have a ton of supplies. I am definitely a supply hoarder. Um, as I think I spoke about last week, if I was given the option basically of, do you wanna buy like a new outfit or a new pair of shoes, or do you want a new art supply? I will definitely budget my money towards a new art supply over shoes or whatever <laughs> other things. And it's just because I really like, it's just relaxing to me to play around with new supplies and just see what they can do. So let's go ahead and jump into this and I'm gonna be sharing with you some of my favorite supplies for just art on the daily basis. So for the very first couple of supplies, I'm gonna run through these pretty quick cause I actually talked more in depth about them last week. I'll make sure to link that video for y'all somewhere in the corner and also in the description down below. But I've already talked about these, so I'm gonna kind of race through them, but at the same time, I do want to just kind of highlight them. So for the very first supply that I really think I've kind of been more drawn to recently is Arches Hot Press Paper. I, I've also been using Fabriano, um, but Arches is more readily available where I'm at, so I can typically get it on sale cheaper. But I've found myself a lot more drawn to the hot press paper recently. However, I do wanna say if you are an absolute beginner, um, definitely stick with cold press because I feel like you learn a lot more of the fundamentals and it's a lot more forgiving if you're using cold press over hot press. But if you've been using cold press for a while, I recommend playing around with hot press. I've found it very enjoyable. And another reason why I really like it is that I can photograph it and I don't have to worry about the textures. It comes out just super crisp and clean when I want a digital copy of my painting. So that is something that I have definitely been drawn to this particular year. The next thing I'm gonna talk about is drawing supplies. And I talked about these also in the last video, but my tried and true drawing supplies are the Kimberly. This is a 9H, I also use 6H um, graphite pencils. These I can get super sharp and super fine lines. And that's how I get my lines super light. So these particular pencils are really, really great for that. Also, if you want like links to these or the specific brands and kinds that I use, I have a blog post that I've put together with all of this and links and everything. So if you wanna check that out, I have a link down below for those as well where I don't have to tell you every single specific thing about it. That way it doesn't take as much time, um, but you're able to find these supplies pretty easily. So the next thing that I talked about in the last video is a pencil sharpener. I really like the Prismacolor Scholar one, that one right there. And I also really like the Mono Black um, Tombow Eraser, this one right here. I talked about that as well in the last video, but I really like this. However, they don't have it, it seems on sale anymore on Amazon. So I linked to another site that I trust where you can buy these and I highly recommend them. I really, really like them and I hope Amazon brings them back. So anyway, y'all are really bad about when I suggest supplies, they disappear on Amazon. So even I have to go looking for them after I discover a new supply and then I mention it, it's like gone. <laughs> so that is another supply that I use. And this one I talked about in the last video. So I talked about natural and synthetic brushes. Now, most of you followed me, you know, I love the Grumbacker and I believe this is the, yeah, this is the Golden Edge line. I really like these. These are synthetic brushes. 
So they're not gonna hold as much water, but there's a good thing to that because it actually gives you a little bit more control um, when you are painting. So I really like the Golden Edge Grumbacker, and I have on the blog what sizes I use for this particular line. The two new ones that I talked about in the previous video were the Silver Black Velvet round brushes. These are a synthetic slash natural brush. That means they're mixed together. And this has squirrel's hair in it. And I really like these particular ones. They kind of give you the best of both worlds for having a little bit more control, but then at the same time, having that absorbency of your paint and water. So these are definitely a must for me now. And these are brand new that I've started playing around with. These are the Da Vinci. Um, and on Amazon, they call these a mop brush, but then on um, the Blick Art Online website, they call them a quill brush. That's what they call them. So these are the new brushes that I've been playing around with. And basically they're made of squirrel's hair. They're all completely natural and they absorb a lot of paint and a lot of water. And I've absolutely been falling in love with these. What's really nice about these, if you've seen online artists who are painting with watercolor and it just seems like they do one long stroke and it's like, oh my word, how are they not refilling their brush? Like by this point, I, I would have had to refill my brush with new paints and then I'd have to worry about oh, I gotta match these two up. So with this new stroke and I don't want a weird texture and like this type of thing, cause y'all, if you've been following me, know that I really like flat washes and like really smooth washes. So I'm always trying to find supplies, whether it be paints or paper um, or brushes that can help me achieve that look. And this, a natural brush actually does help you achieve that look really, really well. So this I would recommend just playing around with. It is pricey, I will say, but comparing it to other natural brushes, I've actually been shopping other natural brushes. They're pretty inexpensive. They're the lower end quality, I think, for natural brushes. Maybe in the future I can try a more high end one, but that's out of my price range right now. Um, but anyway, Hopefully in the future, we shall see. And the last supply that I talked about in the previous video was my easel. I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail, but I'm just gonna say I do use that easel a lot, especially when I'm painting. You'll still see me painting flat for this channel because it's easier to film sometimes painting flat but if I'm painting without filming, um, or if it's something that doesn't really matter, I can just do kind of a creative view, like a time-lapse painting and I'm not teaching anything, um, I'm definitely using that easel. It has helped so much with back and neck problems. Recently, over the past year, I've developed a lot of really bad neck and back problems. And so that easel has helped a lot with just making sure my posture is correct when I'm painting. So I highly recommend that. If you wanna know more about that particular one, you can check out my blog or the previous video because I talked about that as well. So now that we've kind of caught up to the previous supplies that I've talked about, and those definitely are must haves for me, let's talk about some of the new supplies for this particular video that I absolutely love and could not live without. So the very first supply that is new, <laughs> but I didn't mention it in the previous video because I basically ran out of time, but it's actually pretty inexpensive, is a, it's called a drafting glove. A lot of digital artists will use it when they're drawing on a um, iPad basically to help with friction and stuff like that. But I actually have been using this a lot recently, especially when painting on hot press paper. I've noticed, this is gonna sound gross, but <laughs> it is it is what it is. I've noticed when I was painting on the hot press paper, um, sometimes I would sweat 
Um, just my hand, just from trying to go, because sometimes I shouldn't do this, but sometimes I'll paint for like three to four hours straight to just try and knock a painting out. And after holding a pencil or a pen or a paintbrush for that long, your hand's gonna sweat and it's gonna leave oil on your paper. Well, since we're painting with watercolor, oil and water don't mix. So I started noticing as I was painting that I was getting these weird textures. And I was like, where are these coming from? Is this a defect in the paper? Is there something that I'm doing that's wrong? What is going on? Well, it was from the oil from my hand going across the page and even like fingerprints and stuff like that. I was starting, that's when I had the aha moment when I saw one of my fingerprints and I was like, oh, this is the oil from my hands. So I started painting with this guy. I'm thinking about maybe cutting the tips off of this glove um, because it is a, it takes a little bit getting used to and I like my fingertips free, but at the same time, I'm worried to do that because of the oil from my hands getting on the paper. But I will say since using this glove, I have completely eliminated those oil um, textures from my hands, which has helped tremendously. And it's not that expensive. This is the brand that I'm using right now. Hello. Um, yeah, that's correct. But there's tons of other ones. Um, this is just the one that I noticed on Amazon that had a lot of reviews as well as a high star rating. I typically, when I'm trying a new supply, check the reviews and the comments as well as how many people have purchased it and the star rating. And this one had a high star rating, so I picked it up and it works great for me and it's not that expensive. I think it was like $13 or something like that. But this has helped tremendously with just painting. So another supply that I wanna talk about, and I'm not gonna get into really detail with this one because a lot of artists use these. Um, but I have been using more watercolor pencils. I don't typically use them in the traditional way where you color with them and then add water. I use them for kind of added extra details. So sometimes I'll kind of color with these and then water them down just a tad, but still have kind of those pencil marks. So it's more of a softer pencil mark, I would say just to add some extra um, texture. And I just got a small pack of the, I think it's Derwent, Derwent? I'm not sure. I just picked up a small pack though of these particular kind and they work great for me. I have the Winsor & Newton ones um, and I've, use those as well, but I find myself going back towards these more because of the colors. Um, but these are the ones that I use for watercolor pencils. And then the Faber-Castle regular color pencils, I'll use these if I want um, a harsher kind of pencil look. So sometimes I like to add extra textures to my paintings to kind of in my opinion, when you're using like markers or um, colored pencils or crayons, it gives it more of a childlike look. Um, so a couple of times I've used markers as well as crayons to kind of add extra textures that look more childlike. But I would say over all the supplies that I've used in the past, these are the ones that I go to more for those added kind of childlike textures that still have a professional vibe to it, I guess I would say. So these are definitely some supplies that I would grab pretty much on a daily basis just to add some extra lines or some extra textures. The next supply that I'm gonna be talking about, I've actually talked about a lot on this particular channel. I made a video about it last year actually and it blew up. <laughs> but I went into a lot of detail about my watercolor palette setup. And most of you already know, I use metal watercolor palettes. This is one of my old ones. I 
prefer the ones that have all the colors on one side. And here's the reason why. Um, all of my colors fell out just by picking this up. This is one of my older ones. Um, it stores a lot more paint, but at the same time, when you're storing it like this, one of your paint sets is upside down and so the colors are gonna fall out typically. And so it's not a big deal because I can put them back in, but at the same time, my burnt umber is mixed with my cadmium orange. It's got some cadmium orange dust on it. So it's just a little bit of an inconvenience to say the least. But I will say I really like metal palettes over plastic ones. And I've always really been drawn to metal ones. This is aluminum. Um, the reason why I like those is because you can bead, um, have less beading in your palette, which basically means in a plastic palette, typically the paint will just separate and create these little raindrops, I would say, or dew drops inside of your palette which is hard to gauge how much color you've mixed as well as the color hue that you've mixed. Um, whereas if I just scruff this up with a toothbrush really quick at the beginning, and I typically do that every couple of months just to kind of rub up the surface, um, I'll rub it up with a toothbrush and toothpaste and then it will nicely pool inside of my palette, which is a nice little puddle where I can tell how much I've mixed as well as the color hue. So I've really liked working with this particular palette. I do have a new palette that I'm gonna be testing out that someone suggested, but I haven't tested it yet. So if you want me to test that on camera in the future, um, it's actually a plastic palette, but it's specifically has a special material to it that's supposed to help pooling. So I'm looking at it right now. If you want me to test it on camera, please make sure to like that video and leave a comment down below, one or the other, just to kind of let me know um, if you would like that. If not, I'm gonna test it off camera by myself because I wanna see how it actually works. I'm intrigued. It looks interesting. Anyway, moving on. I have two other types of palettes that I use. I use a deep well palette. These I can't find on Amazon anymore. So on my blog, I link to something that's very similar that you can pick up. But basically these are nice to have, especially if you're working, if you're learning first how to paint with watercolors, I call these my training wheels palettes. These are really good for understanding water to paint ratios and kind of what they look like. And eventually you kind of just stop using these for your two paints and you'll move on to a flat surface that's more of a mixing um, surface. So this is my other watercolor palette that I use and this is a mixing surface where I'll mix my paints all together. And I would say this is more of the traditional way of how watercolorist paint. But that being said, I still use these for my watercolor concentrates. I still use these for my inks. So these are not going to kind of collect dust um, in your supply cabinet once you figure out those water to paint ratios with your two paints. Eventually you're going to be using these for other supplies. So I like to include both. This is my deep well palette and this is my mixing surface and then my metal palette basically stores my paints. Or if I'm traveling somewhere, I'll use my metal palette to mix inside of it. So those are my watercolor palettes that I use. The next supply that I wanna talk about is inks. And I love to use inks in my watercolor paintings. I have a slew of watercolor colored paints. Mainly I use the Bombay line, but I will say these are the ones that I go for the most. So when I'm wanting to do just kind of a liquidy um, black paint, I will use this particular one. I talked about it in the last video, so I'm not gonna really get on it too much, but this is one particular brand that I use. 
Um, I linked another one on Amazon that is also another good version of this. And for ink pens, I always use um, the 005. Is that upside down? Yep. <laughs> the 005 Sakura Micron pens. So I really like using these when I want control of where I'm putting my ink in my drawings, such as if I have a really dark element and I want to outline it and a watercolor pencil or a regular graphite pencil is just not gonna do it. I like using these to add those kind of nice crisp outlines that show up basically. So I definitely use these a lot. And then finally, this is my most pricey ink that I own and it is so worth it. And it's the Copic White um, Opeg ink. And this guy is pricey, I will say. But this will last you, if you're using it a lot, this will last you definitely a year. Um, after that, it starts to dry up and I really wish it would last longer but it's mainly because it's every time you open it up, it's exposing it to air and then it's very easily dries up. But this particular ink, the reason why I like it is it's thick enough that it almost acts like acrylic white paint um, if I want it to, but then if I water it down, it will act just like an ink but it's so peg that it still works very, very well. Um, so a lot of you have really liked in the past when I did my whale um, time lapse, I'll provide a picture for you. But the way I got kind of those wavy effects in that whale time lapse was with this paint. And it was the first time I really had experience, um, experimented with this type of ink for that painting and now I use it all the time. I use it for just little dots of accents. I use it to cover up mistakes. I use it to add highlights back in. I mean, this ink I can't speak more of. I would say out of all of my mixed media supplies, this is the one that I go for the most. And that's why I totally feel like it's worth it, even though it is pretty pricey. So those are my inks that I use pretty much on a daily basis. Now let's get into paints. <laughs> so this is probably gonna take a large portion of the video, but I know everybody wants me to really break down my paints and which ones I would recommend. So I'm gonna try and do that as briefly as I possibly can. Um, I've included all of my paints that I use on my blog and website. But these are the ones that I would recommend if you're trying to get a small assortment. So these are the two paints that I would recommend you start out with if you want to kind of get an idea of what professional watercolors are like. And I have been playing around with wash paints. So I've included some of those in here as well, but the very first thing that I would recommend is getting your, I got so many two paints in my hand right now, getting your primary colors. And there's been a huge debate about primaries, I've noticed, primary paints on YouTube recently. So a lot of people are like, the true primaries are these three, which is basically magenta, and yellow and cyan, cyan. And those are what are located inside of your printer. That's true. These are considered modern primaries. And the reason is because with modern technology, we were able to create these. And I highly recommend you get these. So the ones that I recommend is, I really like the Winsor Newton designer gouache. Um, and this is opera pink. So this would basically be your magenta. 
And the reason why I like this one is because it's opaque. Uh, for my watercolor wash course that I teach, I explain in depth why I like opaque as well as transparent watercolors and why I have both inside of my palette. And there is a difference when you're painting and mixing colors. Um, so if you want to check that out, I'll make sure to link that down below. But I always like to kind of have an assortment of opaque as well as transparent watercolors. So this is my opaque, basically magenta primary. This is my transparent um, magenta, which is Brilliant Opera Rose from Schminky. You can also get the Opera Rose from Winsor Newton. I've used that for years. I just find that this particular one has a finer um, paint look so I can get smoother washes with this one compared to the Winsor & Newton, but they're both the same color. They're both operate basically the same way. So if you can't get the Schminky, then go ahead and get the Winsor & Newton one. This one is Cadmium Yellow Lemon. They actually have a um, lemon yellow. Don't get that one. That one's too green. This one looks like highlighter yellow and it is bright. So I use this one as my modern primary yellow. And then finally, I use Holbin's Horizon Blue for my cyan. And as you can tell, I use this one a lot. <laughs> Um, so I use this one for my primary, modern primary. So why is it that, I'm gonna get my paints. So why is it when we're painting with watercolors, they say red, yellow, and blue are our primaries? Well, here's the reason. Technically, these colors, this is considered primary yellow, yellow by Windsor. Um, and this is an intense blue that I use from the gouache set. And it's called intense blue. So these are my blue, yellow, and this is what I use for red for primary. But why is it that a lot of watercolor artists use these colors as their primaries. They call them the traditional primaries compared to actually the modern primaries, which are the ones that I just showed you. That is because these two colors right here are not light fast, meaning they're going to slowly fade over time. So if you're mixing these with other colors, they're going to slightly change with light and they're also slightly going to change hue and fade. So if you want something to last that is museum quality, you can't use these. And that's the reason why there's always this huge debate of what the real primaries are because technically the real primaries are those three. That's why we use them in printers, but they're not light fast. So these three right here are light fast. And that's the reason why a lot of artists who paint with watercolors who want museum quality, where it's going to last 50 to 100 years, they have to stick with these as their primary colors. So, <laughs> And somebody asked me last time, they were like, if any watercolor has um, lake in the name, that means it's not light fast. This one, if you go on the Windsor and Newton site, this one is considered good light fastness. It will last 50 years. Um, I believe it's 50 based on the good quality, but it's considered still, actually I think it's, con yeah, it's considered good quality. But I really like the Scarlet Lake red um, it's a very bright red and it's a very true red. So this is my primary red um, and my yellow and my intense blue. So that's a little bit of a 
chat of the difference between the two. Those six colors, actually seven, I consider a good basis starting point because what's gonna happen is you're gonna get an idea of what color palette you actually like. For me personally, I have the traditional ones in my palette, but I tend to lean more towards the modern colors or the brighter colors. Um, but if you have both in your palette, I feel like you can get a good judge of what you actually like. So I highly recommend starting with these as a kind of starter basis. The next colors that I would add in are considered secondary colors. That would be cadmium orange, which is your orange. And I really like cobalt turquoise. I switch between cobalt turquoise and horizon blue for my kind of modern color primary cyan, but this one actually is more of a green tone. And if you really want those pretty turquoisey ocean color teals, um, this color is the best one to mix with to get those. So this is cobalt turquoise from Schminky. And then Windsor Violet is always a really nice color to have on hand as well as, I really like this one. Um, I always say the name wrong, Quinterdon. It's magenta basically, but it's this particular one. Um, I like having this one to make more of my warmer color purples. Um, you can mix your Windsor Violet with the Opera Rose and get warmer color um, but I feel like this is a better starting point for that. So I always have this one in my palette as a secondary color that's really nice. But that being said, this one once again is not light fast and it's because it's that magenta color. And then the last secondary color that I like to include is Windsor Green Blue Shade. So it's this one and this one, I replace a lot of basic palettes have Verdinand. Um, I believe I'm saying that right. I like this one better and it's because of granulation. I feel like the Verdinand has a lot more granulation than this one. This one still has granulation, but it's not as much. And I don't like granulation. That's just me personally. So this is the green that I use as my secondary base color. And that pretty much would be a beginner starter kit. So I would start with your primaries and then kind of add your secondary colors in after that. So that's those. And then finally, we're gonna talk about watercolor concentrates. And once again, I'm gonna link all the colors on my blog that I have but if you wanna just kind of get a starter set for watercolor concentrates, these are the ones that I recommend. The Echo Line, I went with what they recommended as the primary colors, and you're gonna notice whenever you're choosing colors, you need to kind of stick to the primaries first to get a good vibe of that particular brand. So what I'm, <laughs> What I'm gonna recommend is what the Echo Line recommended, which this one is magenta. And I really like this color. It's really, really pretty. This is sky blue cyan, and there is a sky blue, so make sure you get the sky blue cyan one. So that's this one. And then this is their primary yellow, which is lemon yellow primary. So I would start with those three for the Echo line, plus I recommend adding this one, which is turquoise green. And the reason why I recommend this one is if you're really wanting to get into watercolor concentrates and you don't care that they're not light fast, because these are not light fast, they will change and they will fade with light. Um, 
This guy is the prettiest turquoise color. So a lot of the cobalt turquoise colors that are in tube form, they have a lot, a lot of granulation. If you don't like that, this is the same color, but there's no granulation. It's completely transparent. It looks like stained glass on paper, to be perfectly honest. So I highly recommend picking up this color from them as well. And if you have those four from the Echo line, you'll get a really good feel for just playing around with watercolor concentrates as well as having a good base for pretty much painting and mixing any color that you want to. Um, that being said, if you pick those up, I would recommend picking up these from the PH Martin's Radiant line. So I recommend picking up Wild Rose. This is kind of like your opera rose pink color, so your primary once again. And then since you already have, basically I'm saying if you're getting the Echo line, you basically already have your true kind of primary colors. So instead of getting duplicates of those colors, um, I recommend getting Iris Blue from them. This is a darker blue that makes really pretty purples as well as those dark, it's more of kind of a French ultramarine color or even it's more of a purple and blue, but it's gorgeous. Um, so this is a very different color from the cyan. And then I recommend getting Tangerine. I love this color. It's a very bright red. Um, I recommended that actually in the last video. Tiger Yellow is really nice. It's a warm yellow. It's, in my opinion, it's not really a yellow. It's more of a light, light orange, but it's a really nice color to create peaches if you mix them with the pinks as well as kind of nice warmer tone yellows. So this is a nice secondary color to have. And then finally, jungle green is a really nice color to have from PH Martin. And this would be comparable to the Windsor green um, blue shade. So these two are almost exactly the same color. And those are the colors that I would recommend if you're wanting to play around with watercolor concentrates, but you're not sure necessarily what brand you want to go with, whether the Echo line or the PH Martin Radiant line, or if you just want to play around with watercolor concentrates. Those are the ones that I would recommend for kind of a starting base to play around with, and then you can add more colors here and there. So I think that is all of my supplies, actually. Yeah, that's it. So those are all of my kind of supplies that I reach for, I would say on a daily basis. A lot of the times when I paint things that on Instagram people are like, I don't think this is watercolor painting. I've had several people message me and they're like, I don't think this is watercolor painting. I think you're lying. Um, a lot of times when I get those messages, they're with the watercolor concentrates and I have to tell them this isn't a digital painting. This is with watercolor concentrates. And if you paint with those on hot press paper, you will get those kind of effects. So anyway, hopefully you enjoyed this. Um, I'm sure this is gonna be a long, long video, but um, thanks for sticking with me the entire time. And also thanks for just sitting and chatting and I love talking about supplies. So if you want me to talk more about supplies or any of these supplies more in depth in the future, also let me know in the comments that will help me kind of figure out what type of videos y'all want. So anyway, lots of love y'all. I will see you in the next video and Merry Christmas because it is coming up super fast. So yeah, I can't believe it. It's only like a week away, I think now. Anyway. Happy holidays if you don't celebrate Christmas and I will see you next time. Bye.